Hello, and welcome to the MCA Services YouTube channel. In this presentation, we will be showing you two different chemisorption analysis techniques commonly used for the characterization of metal containing samples, such as catalysts. We have a range of different presentations on our channel, so do take a look at them. And in particular, this one follows our first chemisorption presentation, which looked into the uses and some of the theory behind the technique. So what is chemisorption analysis used for? Chemisorption concerns the formation of chemical bonds between an adsorbate gas and a species on the surface of the sample material. So unlike physisorption, the chemical nature of the sample is actually changed during the analysis. Chemisorption occurs really quite readily to transition metal surfaces. And these are used extensively in cat catalysis where an active metal or metals are held on an inactive support material, such as alumina or a zeolite and so on. Catalysts are used extensively throughout chemical manufacture, pollution control, power generation and so on. And what's more, catalysts are usually really quite expensive, so we seek to minimise the amount of active metal being used whilst lengthening the lifetime and maximising performance. Of particular interest when characterising a catalyst is the dispersion of the active metal. We usually know the precise loading of the active metal on a support material, but it's critical deter to determine exactly how much of this is actually available for a chemical reaction. Through the preparation and activation of a catalyst, a certain amount of the active metal will invariably migrate into the support material. It then, then becomes inaccessible and ultimately inactive. The surface area of the active material is also critically important. Maximising this will increase the number of sites for chemical reactions to occur. So ultimately, chemisorption is used to determine the activity and the efficiency and productivity of catalyst systems. It's important to note that this should be undertaken at all stages of a catalyst's life cycle, through design and manufacture, to the determination of degradation during use, and finally to determining the efficiency of a regeneration process. So what information do we obtain from chemisorption analysis? The first thing is the dispersion of the active metal or metals on the support material. So that is a measure of how much of the active material is actually available for chemical reactions to occur. The second is the surface area of the active material or metals. And that's expressed uh, per, per unit mass of just the active metal alone. And it can also be expressed per unit mass of the entire sample. So that's the sample including the mass of the support material. We can determine particle size and crystallite size, again, of the active materials. And through ammonia or amine chemisorption and temperature program desorption techniques, it's also possible to determine the surface acidity of a catalyst. This applies to the catalyst support material, and it's fundamentally important to the catalyst performance for, for certain chemical reactions. These characteristics are discussed in, in some more detail with a, uh, together with the calculations in our first chemisorption presentation. There are principally two chemisorption techniques, static chemisorption, and by this method, two isotherms are measured in much the same way as a physisorption experiment. The second is pulse or dynamic chemisorption. And by this technique, a series of adsorbate injections of known volume are made to the sample. Before looking at these in more detail, it's useful to have a quick look at the equipment that we used here at MCA Services. We've got two instruments, both made by Micromeritics. On the left hand side is an Autochem 2, and on the right hand side, a 3Flex with chemisorption and TCD options. Both of these photos show a close-up of the analysis tube. It can be seen that for all analyses, a flow-through tube is used, although the flow-through capability is only used for the dynamic technique. Both tubes have a platinum alumina sample in them, and the sample is sitting on a quartz wall plug to stop any sample going through the tube and into the left-hand side of the flow-through. The sample thermocouples can also be seen to the right on the three-flex and to the left on the autochem. In both photos, we can also see the chemisorption furnace. 
For the Autochem on the left, it's a clamshell style furnace, whilst on the three flex, it's a vertical furnace. Now, the furnace is very, very important because chemisorption analyses usually involve an initial cleaning step to remove any extraneous species bound to the sample. These would otherwise reduce chemisorption volume and produce artificially low results. This is usually undertaken by heating the sample in a reducing atmosphere, such as flowing nitrogen, wherever the sample type permits. We'll start by looking at the static chemisorption method. After the sample has been cleaned and is at the desired analysis temperature, and again the furnace is used for this, it is evacuated and an isotherm of adsorption volume against pressure is collected. This is very similar to the experimental approach used for physisorption analysis, which we show in our, our other presentations. This isotherm shows carbon monoxide adsorption onto a platinum on zeolite sample. The isotherm will include two adsorbed carbon monoxide species, physically adsorbed or physisorbed, which is loosely bound by electrostatic forces, and chemically adsorbed or chemisorbed, which is more strongly bound by chemical bonds. Once this isotherm has been collected, we'll then apply a vacuum, which is sufficient to remove the more weakly bound physisorbed CO, but insufficient to remove the much more strongly bound chemisorbed CO. The isotherm analysis is then repeated to give a second isotherm, shown here in blue. Since the chemisorbed adsorbate remains bound to the surface throughout, this adsorption is due entirely to the physisorption process. So if we now subtract the second isotherm, and that's the physisorption only, from the first isotherm, the physisorption and chemisorption, and we do this at each adsorption pressure, we'll obtain just the volume of the chemisorbed adsorbate throughout the isotherm. Now, this has been undertaken on the plot here, and the difference between the two is shown by the blue plot. These volumes, therefore, are just due to the sorption by chemisorption. From the chemisorption, the blue plot, we can now calculate our dispersion, our active metal area, and particle size. We've covered the basis of these calculations in the previous chemisorption presentation, so take a look at that as well. So the foundations of chemisorption by the static method are very similar to those of physisorption. Physisorption, we've, we've covered in a few of our, our other presentations, and we've used that to determine th things like BET surface area, micropore characteristics, and meso and small macropore characteristics. So we can now move on to take a look at pulse or dynamic chemisorption, and this one is rather different. This schematic shows the basic components of a typical pulse chemisorption apparatus. The sample is shown here in green and sitting on the quartz wall plug, and the sample is sighted in the furnace. The thermocouple is also shown, and this is used to monitor and control the sample temperature throughout the analysis. The next principal component is the carrier gas supply, such as nitrogen. And the path of this around the apparatus is shown as the blue line. The flow rate of this is ideally controlled by a mass flow controller, or equivalent, so that it remains constant throughout the experiment. We also have a supply of the adsorbate gas, for example hydrogen, CO or ammonia, and this flows through an injection loop of a very precisely cal calibrated volume. And this is introduced into the carrier gas flow when it's required. The final component is the detector. Both instruments we have here at MCA use a TCD, or thermal conductivity detector. The carrier gas flows through the reference side of the detector, through the sample tube, and then through the analysis side of the TCD. At the start of the analysis, stability of the potential difference across both sides of the TCD must be achieved before proceeding to inject the adsorbate. Once a stable carrier gas flow has been established, the samples reached the desired analysis temperature and the TCD output has stabilised, we can make an injection of the adsorbate. 
And it's worth noting that for pulse chemisorption, it's more common to use a diluted adsorbate, for example, 5 or 10% balanced with the same gas as being used as the carrier. Injection is made via the loop assembly, circled here in yellow. This is opened using a valve to the carrier gas stream so that the carrier gas flushes the contents of the loop into the flow path towards the sample tube and ultimately onto the TCD. The adsorbate in the first dose will flow in the carrier gas stream to the sample and ideally it will be entirely chemisorbed to the active species on the sample surface. So in this case, the only gas passing through to the TCD is the carrier gas itself and we should not see any disruption of the TCD signal. The loop is then moved back so it is filled with a second adsorbate dose and this is again injected into the carrier gas stream. With repeated injections like this of the loop volume, the sample will become saturated. That is to say, all active sites on the surface will become chemically adsorbed to, and any further injections will pass directly through to the TCD. The presence of adsorbate in the carrier gas flow through the analysis side of the TCD will cause an imbalance of the TCD signal due to differences in the thermal conductivity of the carrier and adsorbate gases. And ultimately, this will be observed as a peak on a plot of analysis time against TCD. Here we can see the results from a pulse chemisorption experiment. 10% hydrogen balanced with nitrogen has been used as the adsorbate, and nitrogen as the carrier. The sample in this case is platinum on a Y-type zeolite support. The numbers in grey are the integrated peak areas of each peak in terms of the TCD signal output. Injections of the adsorbate are made via the injection loop, and we can see here that the first two injections are completely adsorbed by the sample. The peak areas shown in grey are very low, and we can't really see any peak on the plot. The third injection is partly consumed, that is to say adsorbed to the sample, indicating that adsorption to the sample is approaching saturation. And this is confirmed by the fourth and fifth peaks, which are a very close peak area. So knowing the peak areas and the volume of the injection loop, we can easily determine the adsorption volume, in this case of hydrogen, on the sample. It's important to note that the volume of the injection loop must be calibrated for a given loop on a given instrument. And from this, we can calculate our usual characteristics of active metal dispersion, surface area, and particle size. We've looked at typical chemisorption experiments, and between this and our other chemisorption presentation, we've seen how the most common characteristics of the active material are derived. Depending on the instrument, there's much more we can do to characterise a sample, though, and we'll just take a brief look at some of the other options now. The first option is the calculation of heat of adsorption of an adsorbate to a sample surface, and this is useful as it can tell us how easily a species is adsorbed. This approach applies to both physisorption and chemisorption, so it's widely applicable throughout surface characterization. It uses the static method. And by this, we collect multiple isotherms at a range of temperatures. In this example, we have three isotherms collected at 268, 278, and 293 Kelvin. And this is for carbon dioxide adsorption. And it is quite common to use more than three isotherms. The adsorbate and isotherm temperatures can be varied according to the system being considered, and more isotherms at different temperatures can be included. Conditions can therefore be tailored to very specific systems. We won't cover heat of adsorption in great detail here, but briefly, the isotherms are converted to an isosteer plot. And this is a plot of the reciprocal of temperature against the natural log of pressure for each adsorption volume at each analysis temperature. From this, the heat of adsorption is calculated. And we'll use the clausius clapeyron equation for this. We can obtain a heat of adsorption plot, and this shows the heat of adsorption against adsorption volume, the latter effectively being a measure of surface coverage. 
With certain dynamic instruments, those equipped with mass flow control uh, and a TCD, it becomes possible to undertake temperature programmed analyses. Essentially, temperature programmed analyses involve monitoring the TCD signal for imbalance between reference and analysis channels as a sample undergoes a temperature ramp under certain conditions of gas flow. For example, temperature programmed reduction, TPR, is undertaken under flow of reducing gas as temperature is ramped from below the reduction temperature of the sample. And from this we can determine the ease at which a sample is reduced or identify the optimum uh, conditions for reduction. Temperature programmed oxidation, TPO, follows a very similar approach to TPR, but instead uses dilute oxygen as the analysis gas. And this can be used to determine the ease at which a sample is oxidised, or the quantity of reducible species on the sample surface. We can also undertake temperature program desorption, TPD. For this, a sample is exposed to a desired species, which is adsorbed to the sample surface. For TPD, the sample is then heated at a steady flow rate in a flow of inert carrier gas, and disturbance of the TCD signal is caused by imbalance due to desorption of the previously adsorbed species. Temperature is inextricably linked to the heat of a desorption, and so it's possible to determine the active energy, activation energy of desorption and the rate of reaction. TPD can also be used for the determination of the number of acid sites on a catalyst support. This is really quite important to certain catalytic processes, for example isomerism and a hydrocarbon cracking. Acid site characterization is commonly undertaken using a basic adsorbate, such as ammonia, and either of static or dynamic chemisorption methods can be applied. An alternative, though, is to apply propylene or propylamine to TPD, with a mass spec even option installed on the instrument. That just leaves me to say thank you for viewing, and I hope that you found this presentation useful. Don't forget, we have others covering chemisorption and physisorption on our YouTube channel, so please feel free to subscribe and take a look.